On April 7, 2021, a bug hunter named William Bowling was able to achieve a remote code execution on GitLab, opening a reverse shell connection by exploiting a zero-day vulnerability within the code that processes image metadata. He was awarded the maximum reward by the GitLab bug bounty program of $20,000, coming in at the 16th highest paid bug bounty in Hacker One history. In order to understand how this vulnerability works, we first need to understand metadata. Most commonly used files, such as images, videos, and even PDFs, consist of two different parts. The underlying content, such as the image representation itself, and the metadata, containing information such as the date and time the photo was taken, the name of the author, the date last modified, keywords, and more. Most of the time, metadata comes in the form of key value pairs, with the keys being the tag names and the values being the associated values. In addition to the commonly defined tags, which are standardized for each file format, there is no issue with adding your own arbitrary tags to the metadata, however some services might not accept them. GitLab has a whitelist of commonly used tags, which it allows to be included with file uploads. All other ones are stripped out and discarded. In order to remove arbitrary tags, GitLab passes user uploaded images to a tool called ExifTool, which is a popular library to work with metadata. When uploading image files to GitLab Workhorse, only files with the extension JPG, JPEG, or TIFF were accepted. To determine what type of file was uploaded, GitLab merely uses the file extension within the file name to make this determination. There is a discrepancy here, as EXIF tool does not use the file name to determine the type of file. It looks at the file content directly. Normally, the first few bytes of a file can be used for identifying the file type. If we were to manually change the file extension, GitLab would classify this file based off the extension, meanwhile EXIF tool would read the contents and arrive at a different conclusion. One of the file types supported by EXIF tool is the Deja Vu format, a PDF competitor that clearly lost its battle and has since faded into obscurity. If you were to name a Deja Vu file with the file extension of .jpg, GitLab would accept the file, hand it to EXIF tool, however EXIF tool would scan the file and treat it as a Deja Vu. Metadata for Deja Vu files comes in the following format, with key value pairs consisting of keyword value combinations nested within inner brackets, nested within a set of outer brackets with the metadata keyword. Something to note is that the value is enclosed within double quotes. As with most string formats, special characters must be escaped. For instance, if you would like to have a double quote character within the string, you must escape it with a backslash. This goes for the rest of the C escape sequences as well, such as new lines, tabs, and the rest. This is an example of what the metadata would look like if you wish to include a quote, a new line, and a backslash. EXIF tool parses metadata character by character. In terms of parsing the value, it has two main goals. First, it needs to identify the beginning and the end of the string so that it knows what is included within the bounds of the value, denoted by the opening double quote and the closing double quote. Second, once this is done, the entire raw value will be successfully extracted and stored as a string. At this point, all C escape sequences will need to be handled. If we were to print out the contents of our string at this point, we would get this. The escape sequences are stored in the string as literal characters. This means that in memory, each character is stored as its ASCII represented encoding, including the escapes. What we want to do is handle all of the C escape sequences, which entails converting them from their literal representations to their interpreted forms. Once handled, printing out the string will result in this. If we take a look at what is stored inside of memory, rather than storing the literal character encodings, the encodings for the escape sequences will be used instead. This is how the two different versions are distinguished from each other. Let's take a look at how each of these steps are accomplished. When it comes to parsing the value, the first goal is to identify the beginning and ending of the string. It turns out EXIF tool is written in Perl, but don't worry if you're not familiar with Perl, the bug hunter wasn't either. As previously mentioned, the metadata is parsed character by character, which happens within this infinite loop. There's two things to be aware of if you're not familiar with Perl. I'll explain them now, but they'll become more clear as we walk through an example. First, the last keyword is equivalent to a break in other programming languages, which is used to immediately exit a loop. Second, there's going to be some regex here, and there's a strange regex mechanism running behind the scenes in Perl. When doing a regex lookup, the location of the last match is internally stored, called the position. If you wish to run a regex search on a string beginning from the location of the previous match, you may include the global modifier. 
Each time this is run, the search will begin from the position of the last positive match, with this position being retrievable with the pause function. $PT is a pointer pointing to the metadata, and $PT dereferences the pointer, resulting in just a regular string. Let's see what happens once it reaches the start of a value. As it's parsing character by character through the metadata, it checks to see if any valid characters remain. It finds this quote, and implicitly sets the position. If it happens to stumble upon the first quote for a given tag, it knows that the string has been opened, and it enters this block of code. At this point, a variable named talk is initialized to an empty string, which will be used to accumulate the contents of the value. An infinite loop is opened, with the goal to keep on appending chunks of characters to talk until we reach the closing quote, at which point we know the string is closed. If there is still a double quote ahead of us, we must keep on iterating. This now internally sets the position right after the next quote. We now append the substring from our previous position to our new position, minus an offset of 1, since we don't want to append the quote itself. We're essentially turning our string into a sandwich and only appending the meat. In this specific case, we arrived at the closing quote, meaning that we only needed a single iteration to extract everything. We hit the last statement, and we're now done. This was a successful value extraction, as talk now contains the value. The purpose of line 227 is to detect if the quote we just hit was a true closing quote, or an escaped quote literal contained within the string. We can only exit our loop if the last quote was a closing quote, not an escaped quote, as this would mean that the string is not yet closed. Let's take this as an example. Once we drop into this block, our regex locates the next quote ahead of us. The meat of the sandwich is appended to talk. It may appear that we are done with our string, but of course, this quote does not actually close the string. It is a part of the string, since it is escaped. Line 227 makes this determination by using this piece of regex, that matches one or more backslashes at the end of the string. It then counts the number of backslashes at the end of the string. If it finds an odd number of backslashes, the quote is deemed to be an escaped quote, and the loop must go on. It only cares about odd quantities of backslashes, since an even number, such as 2, would represent a backslash escaping a literal backslash character. In this case, it finds one backslash, which is odd, and the loop continues. Since we now know that the quote is a part of the string, it appends the quote back onto the end. On the second iteration, it finds the next quote ahead of it, appends the meet, and does the check again. Now it finds zero backslashes, which is a negative match, deeming this quote to be the true closing quote, and is able to safely exit the loop. This is now the valid contents of talk, as it should be. Well that was a fat grind. The point of all of this was to be able to extract the value string from the metadata into the talk variable. Now that this is done, we can go ahead and move on to step 2. This step is going to be quite straightforward. Recall that we need to handle all C-style escape sequences by converting the literal character encodings to the encodings for the escape sequences. In this case, the eval function is used, which acts in the same way that it does in other programming languages. Eval is a function which evaluates a string as though it were raw Perl code. For example, if we define a string that contains Perl code, such as this print statement, we can execute it with the eval function, printing the result. Note that in this case, talk is placed within double quotes, within the QQ wrapper, before being handed to eval. Let's take a step back. In Perl, a string defined with single quotes treats its contents as literals. A string defined with double quotes interpolates the escapes within the string. This is exactly what we want to do at this point, however this is going to be difficult for us as our string is already defined. We need to find a way to wrap the interpolated contents of talk within the double quote literals. You might be thinking that we could just hand this to eval, but we can't, because this string doesn't actually have any quotes a part of it. These quotes technically define the string within Perl, and the talk variable gets interpolated within it, resulting in no change whatsoever. The confusion here lies within the fact that we need to wrap our string with literal double quote characters, yet the double quote characters within the language are merely used to signal a string definition. This is where the double Q wrapper comes in. The double Q wrapper is the same thing as surrounding the contents with double quotes. These two lines here would be logically equivalent. We can now double nest talk within quotes and the double Q wrapper together. The fact that we now have two layers of string definitions enables us to wrap the string in double quote literals. All of this is just shorthand for this, where you can see we just added in the double quotes explicitly. 
This may be confusing, however the end result is a Perl evaluation of this line of code, which is of course now treated as a string definition, which is why the escapes within it are interpolated. At this point, we accomplished all of our parsing goals for our value, and the end result ends up looking like this, as it should. So far, nothing seems out of the ordinary. So, how can we exploit this? You might be thinking that handing user-controlled input directly to the eval function just for the sake of parsing C escape sequences is overkill, not to mention bad practice bordering on the edge of neglect. We're all taught in our CS 101 classes that eval is evil. What stops us from writing whatever Perl code we want into our metadata tag and letting it loose on GitLab servers? We're stopped by the fact that the metadata is wrapped in quotes, since we are only using eval for string interpolation purposes. If we could find a way to escape these quotes, we could directly execute our own code on GitLab servers, as it would be handed to the eval function ripe for execution. In Perl, the qx function can be used to execute system commands, similar to the system function in C. For example, qx ls will execute the ls command. In this case, the bug hunter attempted to inject the following code, which would result in a reverse shell connection being established to the GitLab servers. But again, if we try to include this within our metadata, it will be interpolated as part of a string and will not be executed. Here's where the exploit comes into play. Remember line 227? It uses this piece of regex to match one or more backslashes at the end of a string before counting them and checking if the quantity is odd. Well, the exploit lies within this piece of regex. This means match one or more backslashes at the end of the string. This is an escape, this is the character in question, and this means match one or more. The dollar means match at the end of the string. The issue here is that the dollar has an additional meaning that was overlooked. It also means match before a new line at the end of the string. This means that you could include a backslash, a new line, and then a double quote, and regex would match it. This is the exact tag that the bug hunter used to escape the string context. Let's walk through this example. It finds the opening quote, finds the next quote ahead of it, puts the meat into talk, and runs line 227 to determine if this quote is escaped or not. We now know that it doesn't just search for a backslash at the end of the string, but it also searches for a backslash before the new line at the end of the string. It finds one backslash, which is an odd quantity, and deems that the quote was escaped, and the loop keeps on going. It was tricked into thinking that an unescaped quote was an escaped quote. It now appends a quote to talk, and goes for another iteration. Once again, the meat is appended to talk, and regex gives a match of one. This quote is treated as escaped, a quote is appended, and the loop goes on for a third iteration, finishing off the string. Talk ends up looking exactly like this. Let's put it onto a single line to make it easier to read. When it gets subbed into the eval line, this is what it looks like, bearing in mind that these are the quotes that we need to escape in order to inject malicious code. The inner string is opened and then subsequently closed at this point. This is exactly how we're able to break out of the string context. The dots are just used for concatenation. This is where any arbitrary code can be injected. We then open another quote so that the existing quote in place will then be used to close the second inner string. We can see this work in action, resulting with the curl command being executed. At the end of the day, GitLab was not at fault here, as this was technically a zero day within the EXIF2 library. However, due to the severity and rigor of this bug report, GitLab actually rolled back their policy about paying half bounties for third-party findings, and awarded William Bowling with the full bounty. A patch was issued where EXIF tool now no longer uses eval to handle escape sequences. If you want to protect yourself from malicious files like the one in this video, as well as anonymize yourself with the free-to-use suite of privacy and security-driven tools, check out SquareX. Beginning with their disposable browser, you're provided with a virtualized web browser that runs natively within a regular browser tab, however it's hosted on SquareX servers, providing you with the same mechanics and IP anonymization as a VPN, completely for free. You can browse from any country, access block sites, and geolocks, all with unlimited bandwidth at a multi-gigabit connection speed. You're protected from ads, targeting, tracking, and malware, as everything is being virtually contained within a sandbox. In addition to the web app, their browser extension provides seamless integration into your regular browser. When destroying the session, all history and cookies are permanently deleted. 
The disposable file viewer lets you view and edit files in a secure and private sandbox environment. You're free to drag and drop a wide variety of local files, or have the extension intercept and open downloads from websites automatically, including email attachments. All of this happens from the safety of Square X, protecting you from potential malware and exploits. When you click Dispose, all files in history will be permanently deleted. Disposable email lets you create private burner email addresses that you can use to sign up for services anonymously, protecting yourself from malicious emails. Email Addresses can be customized, regenerated, or burned, deleting all emails and data permanently. Ask any questions you might have in the comments, and click the link in the description to download the extension and start using SquareX for free today. If you're interested in more vulnerability breakdowns, check out these videos, and subscribe to the channel for more content. Thanks for watching.